Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't He won't 
church, we begin our service each week with the words of scripture to remind ourselves who God is and who we are. And so with that in mind, I invite you to stand and join me in proclaiming our call to worship for the season of Easter. God is awesome in his sanctuary. He gives power and strength to his people. Let us pray. Victorious Lord, you have conquered sin, <clears throat> death, and the devil, making way for our lives to be reconciled to the Father through the gift of your Son and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Make us aware of your nearness to us in this sanctuary today, we pray, so that our lives might reflect the transformed power of your glorious resurrection. We give you all glory, honor, thanks, and praise due your name. Amen. Church, in the joy of the resurrection, I invite you to turn and pass the peace of Christ to one another.
Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In grass meadows, he makes me to lie down. By quiet waters, he guides me. My life, he brings back. of justice for his name's sake. Though I walk in the veil of death's shadow, I fear no harm, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. It is they that console me. You set out a table for me in the face of my foes. You moisten my head with oil. My cup overflows. Let but goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long days. Gentle shepherd, come and continue singing recognizing that God our good shepherd he leads us but not just as individual sheep rather as a flock a community a body people who are led by a good shepherd to care to feed to lead and protect the world that we have been called to
This morning, as we are gathered in this room, some of the youngest members of the college church community are up in Splash, and they too are spending time worshiping God as well as learning about God's word. Uh, But for the last few months, a specific focus of their teaching has been upon giving, and specifically giving of offerings, not only the offerings of their treasures, but also of their lives holistically. And today is a day of celebration up in Splash, because as the children have been exploring this idea of giving unto God, what God has given to them, uh, today they celebrate the collection of over $300 in the past few weeks to give to the Bowman Stone Community Park Project. Um, So getting on board with what God is doing here locally in our community, and they're celebrating that. And I want us to take a moment and celebrate that with them today. So clap, hoop it up, because I forgot something down here. We thank God for what he is doing in the next generation of College Church. Um, And I brought this up because each week we too give of our tithes and offerings, whether it be online or one of the boxes in the back of the sanctuary. And then at the end of each month, we take extended and intentional time to thank God for all of the gifts he has given to us and celebrate the ways that this body here at College Church is able to generously share them to maintain and extend the work of God here in Grant County and really around the world through the ministries of our local church. We realize that for some, this past month has been plentiful, but for others of us, it has been a time that has required great faith that there would be enough. And so by God's grace, we gather together today as a testament to the faithfulness of God. And this morning we will use this basket as a sign of our collective tithes and offerings from the past month. And each month, another basket will be added to the altar. As we respond in thanksgiving to God's graciousness, I wanna invite you now to stand and also to hold out your hands as an action of response to God and thanksgiving through the many languages represented here in our local congregation. join me in praying these words together. Most gracious God, we thank you and praise you for giving us more than enough. Accept the offerings of your people. In your love, remember those who have brought it and those for whom it was given. Follow it with your blessing that these seeds of generosity may bear the fruit of your kingdom in our community and around the world. Amidst the fear of scarcity, make this body a source of your abundance. When we receive, open our hands. When others grab, teach us to give. When others hoard, teach us to share. And when we are tempted to worry about tomorrow, Remind us that you have given us everything we need. By your Holy Spirit, make us cheerfully one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Be seated. 
just as we have entrusted our gifts to God, now we entrust the concerns of our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Will you join me? Gracious God, in the beginning, you set the earth in motion. You created everything we enjoy today in the land, sea, sky, and every creature that roams the earth. You made us, almighty creator, allowing us to play a role in caring for and tending to your beloved world. How then it must grieve you, God, when you see your children warring against your creation and against one another. We mourn with you at the atrocities and violence happening today in Sudan. And we implore you to intercede on behalf of all who are there in such great need of relief and restoration. We continue to lift up to you today all those in Ukraine and Russia whose lives are still so far from normal, devastated by war. God, we pray your peace to cover the earth and that we, your church, would stand as advocates for all those who are cold, tired, naked, hungry, alone, and afraid. In Jesus' name. We ask for comfort, God, for all those in our country who are grieving the loss of loved ones today as a result of senseless violence. May your Holy Spirit redirect and guide us, O Lord, so that we might be a people of peace and people who value the precious gift of life that you've given us. It's in that spirit, Lord, that we intercede this morning for those from within our congregations who are sick, suffering, or recovering from illness or surgery. We continue to pray your peace and comfort for the Bardsley, Woods, and Harris families. We thank you for making your nearness known to these people who are precious to us, especially in these difficult days. And we lift to you also, God, this morning, Judy Leach. Thank you, Lord, for bringing her successfully through such complicated surgery this week. Thank you for how well she is doing in these first days post-surgery. We ask now that you would continue to heal, restore, and strengthen her in the coming days, and that you would meet with her, even this morning, in her hospital room. Use doctors and nurses and all that will serve her today to remind her of your nearness, we ask. Now, Lord, as we attune our hearts to your word, we pray that as we receive your revelation, you would transform us into your likeness. Inspire us to respond to you today, God, in new ways that reflect your glory, reflecting your glory to all those we encounter in the days to come. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our resurrected Lord. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord that is found in the Gospel of John and in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind the locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Live a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called of God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. These are the gifts 
God gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will mature in the Lord, measuring up the full and complete standard of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I hope this isn't an omen. Man, it's going to be a long morning, brother. Jeez. Or I was saying every year about this time, uh, our staff goes through training for CPR. Uh, this, if this makes you feel safer, you're probably overestimating our abilities. Liz Ewer comes in with 11, 12 of her dummy friends, and we spread them on the floor in the chapel. And then the staff take turns getting over her dummy friends and doing what she teaches us to do. Uh, she tells us it's two breaths and then 30 compressions. I'm going to be careful about this because I know there's a bunch of medical professionals uh, in the room right now, getting ready to prove yourselves by correcting what I say. Tell me afterwards if I got this wrong. I think it's two breaths and then 30 compressions. And the compressions have to be delivered at about with force and at the, about the same speed. It's not casual. It's aggressive. She's taught us that we should do it <laughs> to the tune, staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> so now you can envision uh, staff in the chapel while they're compressing, doing staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> and then there's two breaths. Uh, this year she came back and she told us that if we wanted, we could change the song, I'm not making this up, from uh, staying alive to another one bites the dust. <laughs> bum, 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 another one bites the dust, uh, that. So you get the idea. Now, I think it was because after she saw our staff practice, she knew that nobody we were helping was staying alive. They were all biting the dust. So should you lose consciousness? And that's not unheard of in college church. And you are unresponsive and unable to help yourself. Should you awaken for a moment, you might pay attention to the song that is being sung while somebody does compression, it could be an omen. You're either staying alive or biting the dust. Now, if I have this right, and here's where the medical professionals can help me, these two things work hand in hand because the pressure, the compressions with our hands help circulate the blood throughout the body, but the breathing into the other person's mouth helps oxygenate the blood and hopefully uh, stimulate respiration. In other words, jumpstart the person's breathing, if you will, on their own. How am I doing so far? Am I right? 
Well, when I was reading this passage in John chapter 20, that's what, that was the first image that I had. I, I thought what we've got is Jesus in a room with 11 of his dummy friends after the resurrection and he breathes onto them or into them and says, receive the spirit, and they come back to life. So far, so good. Then I remembered that in the beginning of time, when God formed the man from the dust of the ground, he bent down and breathed into his nostrils the ruah, the breath of life, his own breath, and he became a living soul. The breathing into another person when they are unconscious and unresponsive is taking something that is very personal and inside of you and transmitting it into that other person's lungs. You are, in essence, loaning them your breath until they have their own because they can't breathe. So now I am picturing God stooping over this man that he has formed and breathing his own breath into the lungs of that man until it stimulates life and he comes alive and becomes a living soul. I remembered in Ezekiel 37 when the prophet is shown a valley of dry bones, all dead. The word breath is used two or three different ways in that passage, as wind and as breath and as spirit, all three. And the prophet is told that the day will come when Yahweh will breathe his breath into Israel and they will come alive. And then about 14 verses later, he says, I will give them my spirit or my breath and they will become alive and they will become a new nation. And suddenly the metaphor changed. What God is doing, I thought to myself, is he is not simply resuscitating someone that is dead. He is creating Life that has never existed before. He is forming a new man, or in the case of Ezekiel, forming a new nation by giving those people the breath or the spirit from God's own lungs. Are you with me so far? This is not simply a resurrection, this is a new creation. What God is forming in John 20 has not existed up to this time. And then, I remembered something that I was taught a long time ago that changed the way that I read this text. I think everyone in the room knows it, but we forget it. But that's that the Gospels were written much later than we think. The Gospel of John, for instance, was probably written around the year 90 to 95 A.D. What that means is that this Gospel, these stories were transmitted to the people of God 50 to 60 years after Pentecost. That means that the church was already thriving, growing, meeting in little households. Paul's letters are full of greetings to people that met in households. One says between 30 and 40 people in number. There were no large churches back then. And at the same time, Christianity was being persecuted. Nero would come forward in 65 and start 
orchestrated persecution of the Christians. In the year 70, he commissioned the building of the Colosseum. In 80, it was done. And they began to feed Christians to beasts in the Colosseum. And that was just one site. There were three or four other major sites in the Roman Empire where the Christians were being herded up and sent to their deaths because of their convictions and their beliefs. And why this is important is because it means when John wrote this gospel and when he told these stories, he wasn't just telling history so you would know what happens. There was another agenda, I think, and that agenda was to tell the life of Jesus in a way that would inspire Christians who were afraid for their own lives. Their communities were small, their heroes were all dead. Their religion was against the law. They were being persecuted by the dozens when John sat down to write this letter. And when I remembered that, I started to read the passage differently. Now, I promise I won't say anything you don't already know. This is college church. You guys know everything, so I'll, I'll move through this part quickly. First, all of the pronouns in this passage are plural. They're not singular. So Jesus never says, peace to you. He says, peace to y'all. This means that what Jesus was doing was stepping into a community that was being formed as y'all. He wasn't resuscitating 11 dummies. He was creating something new with his breath, his spirit, out of one new person like a body, these believers. Second, there is uh, an apparent, if subliminal, structure that carries the story. There is a gathering followed by a sending, followed by an indwelling. The text says, when they were together, that's the gathering. When they were together, Jesus appeared and showed himself. And they were overjoyed. And he said to them, as the Father sends me, so I'm sending you. So the gathering become the sending. And then as they were going out, he breathed. There is no onto or into in the original. He just exhaled and said, receive the Spirit. And then he gave them the powers of a priest. When you forgive, they're forgiven when you retain or hold on to it, it is held. And um, Eugene Peterson says, what are you going to do with it? Third, the peace be with you is not a greeting. It's a gift. He says it twice not one time. It was a common rabbinical greeting, but he said it twice. He came into the room and said, peace to you, and then showed them his hands inside, and they were overjoyed, and he said it again, peace 
to you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So peace is not something Jesus is just speaking. It is something he is bringing into that room. And there's two ways to figure this out. You can either do a word study if you want, bore the life out of yourself by looking up the meaning of peace, or you can just read the New Testament and ask what is happening in places where Jesus speaks peace. In the New Testament, when Jesus speaks peace, the storm is suddenly calmed down. The forces of nature are made to mind again. They are reordered. When Jesus speaks peace, a woman who was once ashamed is healed of her disease and brought back into her community. When Jesus speaks peace, a woman is elevated in the presence of her peers and sent out into a life of peace. When Jesus Jesus speaks peace, two different sides, warring ethnicities, warring tribes become one new humanity. So Jesus comes into the room bringing peace and nobody in the room has it because they are scared out of their mind. He's not telling them be at peace. He is bringing to them the peace that he speaks. Are you with me so far? So they are nervous, they are afraid, and Jesus comes and presents himself to that room and he carries himself what he wants them to have. And as he shows himself to them, peace arises. Which leads to four. The sending comes in the gathering, not after it. In the midst of their overjoyed, he says, now I'm sending you. Wherever Jesus meets with his disciples, the same thing happens. He doesn't just meet, he always releases them into the world. People, this is crucial for our gatherings. It means that there is a centrifugal power in this room right now if we do it right. If we get worship right, it throws us outward onto the world to carry what we got right in this room. Still there? Yes? Here's the last piece. As they're leaving, he exhales and says, receive the Spirit. And if this seems like an add-on to you, consider what this moment becomes without it. If Jesus does not give them his Spirit in this moment, he is in effect saying in the sending, Now, go out into the world, people. Uh, Good luck out there. (laughs) But when he gives them his spirit, he is giving them the very power that animates him. I'll get to the point. Whatever you're doing in your life, you could do it better if you did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. He is a vastly underestimated power in the Christian's life. The Catholics have apostolic succession and the Protestants have a core set of beliefs. But both of us have underestimated the power of the Holy Spirit when he is released and when he is inhaled by the people of God. He changes the way people live. We ought to be able to do things that we cannot do without the Holy Spirit. Are you there now? So I'll cut to the chase. I think the reason John wrote this story is he's trying to tell a group of young Christians scared out of their minds. 
people, every time you gather, Christ is present and he presents himself. You say, man, I don't see him, which is funny because there's some people in this room can't not see him. It's simply a matter of learning to use the faculties for which God has given us to see the resurrected Christ. Are you there? He gave you eyes to see a sunrise, ears to hear a song, and taste buds to taste the fruit. You cannot see a melody. You cannot hear a sunrise. You must use the faculty that God gave you to apprehend the thing he made the faculty for. Even so, God has given you, Christian, faculties for seeing the risen Christ among us. In a moment, when we go to the table, he will present himself again. And if it seems to you like two common, ordinary elements... Well, you need to work on those faculties. I think Christians today gather like Christians in that day. I think the predominant, this is just my opinion. I think the predominant mood in Christian gatherings in America today is fear. Anger's close, but I think anger is a response to the fear. I think the predominant spirit in American churches today is fear in the form of suspicion. We are suspicious of the government, we're suspicious of the public, and we're suspicious of each other. It is fear in the form of defensiveness. We are defensive about our rights. We're defensive about our convictions. We are defensive about our beliefs. We're defensive about our freedoms. It is fear in the form of intimidation. We are intimidated by our critics. We are intimidated by our leaders. We are intimidated by each other, our peers. We are intimidated by laws and executive orders. It is fear in the form of uncertainty. We're uncertain about our standing or our reputation, uncertain about our gatherings or our identity. We are uncertain about our chances or our future. What I'm saying is almost every Sunday when the doors are open, the people of God gather and push back the fear long enough to worship. But worship in America is suspended fear. And then the moment it's over, we go back to what Christians call the real world. And what John is saying is, this is the real world. In the midst of your fear, you gather, and Christ is present in our midst. He reveals himself, and you see him. And when you see him, your confidence in Jesus is greater than your fear of everything else. And then in the midst of your gathering, when your emotions are at the peak and you want to build three tents and stay there forever, he turns to you and says, now go and sends us into the world like he himself was sent. And by the way, on our way out, he exhales and the people of God are filled with the spirit as they go. Can you imagine the change in every discipline in the county, 
if the Christians who did those jobs did it in the power and animation of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So I sat down with these Christians this week. I did. I sat in the corner of the room and pretended that they were in the middle of it. (laughs) And I picked up Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And I tried to imagine what Paul would say to a group of scared Americans who have gathered for worship. And as I read this letter, I'm pretty familiar with it, but as I read it like this, you guys, I begin to hear a voice. And I'll try to put, it's very brief, but I'll try to put words to it. I think he would say, church, whether you know it or not, you are the only hope of the world. You are the presence of the future. God has a plan that he has already started. He is bringing every power in heaven and on earth under the authority of Jesus Christ. And you, despite your limitations and your flaws, which are many, are a central component in that plan. If God could do it without you, he doesn't intend to. You are a representative of the world that is coming. I think he would say to us, you are not a nonprofit organization. You are not a 501c3. You are not a conservative voting bloc. You're not a funding stream for somebody else's ideas. You're not a pool of volunteers for some other cause in Grant County. You are a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people that God has called out of darkness and brought into light. So you must declare the praises of him who has done this, called you out of darkness and brought you into light because once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You are the works of God. You are the new humanity. You are the household of God. You are a temple or a cathedral to the Almighty. You are a new nation that God is forming within a nation on the earth. I think he would say, so live up to your calling. If this is who you are, your posture should not be one of entitlement, but one of humility. You should not be demanding. You should be gentle. And you shouldn't be critical. You should be patient. You shouldn't correct everybody. You should bear with one another just as God bears you in Jesus Christ. I think he would say, in your gathering, Build one another up. 
believe in the body. Stay in the body. Serve the body. Because when the body grows, you grow. But if the body doesn't grow, you're not really growing. You see, sooner or later, everything in the room warms up to room temperature. So you have to pay attention to the culture that you're building when you gather. And when you're sent, remember, you're not just winning souls. You're not just evangelizing people. You're converting them. You're not populating heaven. You're a colony from heaven living on the earth. Live up to your calling, church. Everything God is going to do someday with the world, he started. It's already here. Look around you. You're thinking, this is as good as it gets? This is as good as it gets. It's us. Without all the flaws and the limitations. It's same old ordinary us with the breath of God in our lungs. If you've come to help us serve communion, would you please find your way to the front? If you have children that are upstairs, this is a great time to go get them. Every time we gather church, our minds go in a hundred directions like they did back then. We compare ourselves, we think about what's coming. Our minds just tend to drift. But every time we come to the table, the Bible says that Christ presents himself to his people again. And so this morning, what I need you to do is to know and believe that Christ is present wherever we break the bread and we share the cup. Here in celebration of Easter, here in the shadow of new life, Christ stands amongst us again, breaks the bread and says to the people of God, this is my life. You are seated with me in the heavenlies. You are raised with me. You are redeemed with me. You live in me as you eat this bread. Here again, Christ passes the cup from person to person. And as we take it, he says to the new community, this is a new covenant with the new family of God. When you take this cup, you take my life, my breath. You take ownership of me and I take ownership of you. Jesus through these elements and in these elements.
do for us what no other elements can do. Like breath, convey, transmit life to those who eat. For the sake of Jesus, in Jesus' name. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that
church, would you stand and let's sing a final chorus together? Church, as you prepare to go from this place today, be reminded that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon you. You have been anointed to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to bring freedom to the prisoners of this world. In the power of Jesus' name and by his Holy Spirit, you are sent.